Um, now it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the Institute, Laura Llewellyn, uh, back where she, uh, for a period in her uh, rising career as an art historian, was, was on the faculty teaching the art history program here in the British Institute of Florence. Um, before that, she, she had trained at the Courtauld Institute uh, in London, um, and then from the Institute, she moved on to um, Los Angeles, California, where she worked at the Getty Museum for a number of years, a very prestigious. She's associate curator of Renaissance painting. So it is a great pleasure and, and honor, really, British Institute. And she's going to tell us a lot about um, Gotsili in Florence as a warm up, if you like, for the exhibition, which opens next week. So over to you, Laura. Thank you very much, Simon, and uh, good evening, everybody. Um, I would like to thank Simon, first and foremost, for his kind invitation to speak to you this session. Um, it, I really am sorry not to be there in person. This feels very kind of, it feels Combobulating, to say the least, to be to not be in the rooms. And um, as Simon says, I have a long history uh, there with the institution, not just um, as a lecturer, but also before that as an undergrad. Um, so um, I'm I'm there in spirit, truly. Um, thanks to all of you as well. I know that we've all, all got Zoom fatigue at this point, so I really appreciate your kind attention. Um, and so Simon has already highlighted it, but I just wanted to kind of reinforce that um, the exhibition at Palazzo Medici Riccardi entitled Benozzo Gozzoli e la Cappella dei Magi um, opens at um, the Palazzo Medici Riccardi next week, Thursday the 16th, and it is curated by Serena Nocentini and Valentina Zucchi. Um, and the focus of um, the exhibition will be Benozzo in Florence. And I have developed my lecture this evening um, out of my own contribution to their ex exhibition catalogue. So, you know, I'm not the curator of the exhibition, I'm not directly involved in the exhibition, but I have written a, an essay which explores the altarpiece whose main panel is here at the National Gallery and is sadly too fragile to travel. Um, so I hope that for those of you who have the chance to visit the show, this lecture will act as a kind of missing piece of the puzzle in the story of a Bonozzo in Florence. I'm just going to dive right in. Um, Bonozzo was born in Scandici. Sorry, my slides are moving slowly. Um, Bonozzo was born in Scandici in around 1421, the son of Lese, that is Alessio di Sandro. He was called Gozzoli for the first time by Vasari in the second edition of his Lives, published in 1568. And that's where we find the fruits of Vasari's kind of in-depth research into Florentine genealogies in full evidence. The, per the first professional record of Bonozzo um, is from January 1444, which finds him entering the workshop of Lorenzo Ghiberti, where he remained for three years to collaborate on the second set of doors for the baptistry. But Bonozzo came to Ghiberti as a fully fledged assistant um, and not as an apprentice. Of his earlier training, we know nothing concrete. It is highly likely, though, that a significant part of his formation happened under the aegis of Frangelico, and that he was at his side on the scaffolding for much of the fresco work that took place at San Marco between 1436 and 1443. There is broad scholarly consensus that uh, Bonozzo's hand is to be found in the frescoes in the north corridor of the dormitory in the lay brother's cell, and I'm here showing you the private cell of Cosimo il Vecchio de' Medici. But even so, it is not clear that Bonozzo was apprenticed with Frangelico in an official sense. And despite Vasari's statement that he was, many scholars now believe that Bonozzo may have received the bulk of his formal training with another master, perhaps Giovanni del Ponte or Bici di Lorenzo. Bonozzo left Florence and Ghiberti's employ in early 1447 to join Frangelico in Rome to work on a now lost fresco in the chancel of St. Peter's. He then accompanied Frangelico to Orvieto to collaborate in the chapel of San Brizio and then back to Rome to collaborate on the Nicoline Chapel in the Vatican Palace. 
There are a handful of devotional panels that make up a small corpus of Bonotto's earliest independent works, but he was actually relatively old, probably about 30, when he began working entirely independently on major commissions. His first signed work appears in Montefalco, where he undertook an ambitious campaign of frescoes in the Church of San Francesco. In the following years, Bonotto worked in Viterbo, Perugia and Rome, but the majority of his works from these years are lost. In 1458, he was hired to paint much of the coronation regalia for the crowning of Enea Silvio Bartolomeo Piccolomini as Pius II. It was probably this work in Rome, um, in particular frescoes now lost, but which Vasari tells us contained many fine portraits that brought him to the attention or back to the attention, given what we know about his activity in, Co in Cosmo's cell, um, back to the attention of Cosmo Il Vecchio de' Medici. By May of the following year, Bonozzo was back in Florence, where he found himself working for the city's ruling family and to adorn one of the most significant spaces in their new palace. Returning to Florence after a decade-long absence, Bonozzo would have found the artistic landscape of his native city much changed. The two great pillars of his formation, uh, Frangelico and Ghiberti, were dead. The last great painter of that generation, Filippo Lippi, had shifted his activity to Prato. Um, Castagno and Pesolino, the most promising artistic, uh, artistic talent of Bonozzo's own generation, had been carried away by the plague of 1457. Domenico Veneziano had all but ceased his activity. The only pa major painter active in Florence was Paolo Uccello, um, who was approaching his twilight years and focusing increasingly on paintings in small format. Bonozzo's vast experience as a painter of frescoes combined crucially, I think, with his reputation as a portraitist gave him the edge and he landed the most prestigious commission to date to adorn the walls of the small, exquisitely beautiful chapel at the core of the Medici Palace on Via Larga. I wonder if Bonozzo believed himself to be home for good at this point. Immediately upon his return, negotiations began for his wedding and by the following year, he had married Lena, his wife of at least the next 35 years. But this was in fact only to be a five year sojourn, relatively brief in the long arc of Bonozzo's career before he headed off again to work in other, part of Tusc other parts of Tuscany, ultimately settling in Pisa. Given what we know of Bonozzo's immense productivity, in addition to recorded works which are now untraced, we can assume that much of Bonozzo's Florentine output from these years is lost. Other than a handful of fragmentary predella and pilaster panels, there are two major commissions which attest to this moment in his career, both of which in different ways saw Bonozzo situated at the very heart of civic and religious life in Medicean Florence in the final years of Cosmo's life. The cycle of frescoes in the Medici Chapel, but once a site of worship and a private audience chamber, was an exceptionally ambitious undertaking, and today, especially given the loss and damage of his work in Pisa, is celebrated as Bonozzo's magnum opus. It is almost without comparison in the history of early Renaissance painting for the number of portraits, the expanse of landscape paintings, the detailed flora and fauna, and not to mention the splendor of the costumes. But in the wake of the remarkable success of the Medici frescoes in the chapel, Bonozzo seems to have secured his next commission in Florence with ease. It was an altarpiece to adorn the oratory of the Compagna della Purificazione e di San Zanobi, the, the company of the purification of St. Zenobius, a youth confraternity whose premises were located within the observant Dominican convent of San Marco. And it's this work that we will now turn. The commission for which several documents have come down to us was fulfilled by Bonozzo between 1461 and 1463. 
The original altarpiece ensemble included five narrative scenes in the predella, now dispersed into various collections across the world, and a gilded frame, now lost. The central image is today in the national um, in the collection of the National Gallery in London and depicts the Virgin seated in a verdant walled garden and surrounded by angels whose colourful wings crisscross to form a resplendent aureole behind her. On her lap she steadies the naked Christ child perched on one foot and positioned frontally with his small hand raised in benediction. Huddled around them are six saints in attitudes of rapt devotion. The gathered company is bathed in a strong light from the left, which seems to glisten across the array of ornate surfaces, shot silks, colored marble, fabrics woven with gold, bejeweled garments, and meticulously tooled wings and halos. This is in many respects, a much more traditional image than Bonozzo's recent fresco campaign, offering him none of the same opportunities for portraiture and landscape painting. Even so, the altarpiece's visual splendor, the effusive use of gold, costly pigments, rich glazes, splendid surface pattern, and the detailed rendering, rendering of flora and fauna is an extension of his achievements on the chapel walls. The altarpiece is also the product of Bonozzo's diligent and sensitive response to, response to a complex brief. And to understand his achievements fully, we must understand his challenge. Bonozzo's altarpiece would provide the backdrop against which much of the life of the confraternity was to be enacted. So I would like to give you a brief introduction to the confraternity, its history and its role within the fabric of Florence's civic and religious life. I would then like to look together at the commission, Bonozzo's contract and the resultant altarpiece and evaluate his achievement from the point of view of the patron's expectations and within the context of his Florentine output. The group had been find it, founded at the premises of Santissimo Nunziata with a dedication to the purification of the Virgin, which was the principal feast of the Cathedral of Santa Maria del Fiore. From the offset then, the fledgling confraternity's religiosity was declaredly civic in character. Seven years after its foundation, the purification confraternity moved their activities to the hospital of San Mateo, where they came under the aegis of the flagellant adult confraternity of, the, of Santa Maria della Pietà, uh, which was also called the Buca di San Girolamo. A guardianship arrangement that seems to have persisted for the rest of the century. During this period, the group further enhanced their patriotic profile by adopting as their protector, Saint Zenobius, first, first bishop and much loved patron saint of Florence. The purification's membership mushroomed in these early years with around 800 new recruits in the decade following their arrival at San Matteo. Membership comprised of boys 12 upwards from across Florence's social spectrum with the majority hailing from artisan classes boys who were apprenticed in the cloth trade or related activities such as tailoring, spinning and working in haberdashery shops. Religious instruction was at the bedrock of the confraternity's mission. In 1442, the purification was one of four youth confraternities in Florence formally recognized and assigned a shared overseeing authority by the Pope. The papal bull was issued on the feast of St. John the Baptist, Florence's foremost patron saint, an indication of how the activities of these groups were perceived to be both spiritual and civic in nature. During the same period, the group also came under the protection of the city's de facto ruler, uh, Cosimo de' Medici il Vecchio, who provided them with permanent lodges at the newly refurbished convent complex of San Marco as part of his overall patronage of the site. The company took possession of their new oratory in 1444 on the feast day of St. Peter and Paul in a, in a special ceremonial procession. Their arrival at these new premises ushered in a new era, one which was marked by the production of a new set of statutes to reflect their changed circumstances. And in this document, St. Zenobius was formally named as the joint titulus of the confraternity. Significantly, too, the company adopted an additional dedication to Saints Cosmas and Damien, the patron saints of the Medici family. 
The addition of these two saintly guardians represents a key marker in what uh, Lorenzo Polizzotto has called the politicization of the purification, a trend which was matched in the statues by a new emphasis on the youth confraternity's role in the public life of the city. The confratelli, dressed in white surplices, were to take part in a number of ecclesiastical and civic processions. They were to perform sacred plays annually on the Feast of the Purification and to open their premises to the public on, feast, on the feast days of their saintly protectors. A processional banner painted by Frangelico must have been commissioned around this time when the confraternity's participation in processions was ramping up. Now lost, the inventory records show that it depicted Saint Zenobius on one side and on the other, the Virgin with two white doves on her shoulder, holding the Christ child and with a robed member of the confraternity kneeling before them. It was rare for confraternities to own their own meeting premises and the resulting stability saw the community prosper over the next 50 years. As many as 80 new recruits joined the group in the year that they were established at San Marco. Located in the second cloister north of the church, the confraternal premises consisted of three main rooms. The entrance at the northwest corner led directly into a chapel for which Cosimo donated an old altarpiece depicting Saints Cosmas and Damien to whom the chapel was dedicated. The neighbouring room was the largest, an oratory known as the Corpo, and was dedicated to the purification of the Virgin and Saint Zenobius. Adjoining was a third room which was described as a sacristy. We know from the company's extensive records that the majority of their devotional activities and administrative business were enacted in the main oratory. Here, they held their regular gatherings, coming together to sing laude or hymns, to recite the office of the Virgin, to hear mass, to receive spiritual instruction and to profess their faults. It was also the space where the community performed their plays and welcomed the public on special feast days. In the 15 years following their arrival at San Marco, the confraternity's newly minted public duties saw them become a prominent entity within the Florentine religious calendar. Their progress was impeded briefly when during the 1450s, Cosimo's grip on Florence was threatened by a series of political challenges intended to impede his authoritarianism. In 1458, having exposed and, ex and suppressed a handful of plots against him, he imposed a city-wide ban on confraternal meetings on the basis that these were breeding grounds for grassroots sedition. Despite being direct beneficiaries of Cosimo's munificence, the purification was not immune and the group was compelled to cease its activities. The cessation was comparatively short-lived though, and the resumption of paid dues by the, the group's members on the 25th of March 1461 indicates that they were meeting again by this date. Within five months of their regrouping, Bonozza Gozzoli was at work on a new altarpiece for the company's oratory. There is nothing surprising about the confraternity's choice of Bonozzo for the project. Emerging from the completion of the procession of the Magi fresco cycle inside the Cosmo's splendid new palazzo, the painter may well have come into the employ of the confraternity at the recommendation, perhaps even under the directive of Cosimo himself. The elderly benefactor certainly had a hand in the wider campaign to furnish the oratory, contributing part of the funds for a new set of choir stools, which were installed following the purification's merger with the San Marco Laudesi confraternity in 1464. Even excluding his recent patronage by the confraternity's benefactor, Bonotto must have seemed an obvious choice. Indeed, the commission was not the company's first dealings with Bonotto, who they had hired in 1458 to paint a crucifix. Other examples of his work could be found across the San Marco site from his time as youthful collaborator of Fra Angelico. And since these early projects at San Marco had likely coincided with the arrival of the purification at the site, Bonozzo would have been well acquainted with the group's activities and confraternal mission. Following Angelico's death in Rome six years earlier, Bonozzo was his nat natural successor, both at San Marco and as a favoured artist of the Medici and their circle. 
In the Medici chapel frescoes, he had proved himself more than capable of expressing in visual terms the goals and ideals of the Medici family. The confraternity surely would have hoped that he would now do the same for them. The survival of several documents relating to Bonotto's commission for the purification altarpiece is highly unusual. The contract is the most detailed of the various records, and it is very well known to scholars of Quattrocento Florentine patronage and workshop practice. It was drawn up on the 23rd of October 1461 by a notary acting on behalf of the adult representatives of the purification company. Uh, Domenico di Stefano, a linen merchant acting in the capacity of custode e guardino um, for the whole confraternity, undertook the role of contract guarantor along with three other witnesses, Giovanni D'Angolo, um, Francesco D'Antonio and Piero di Ser Andrea Bonci, um, who was the notary himself. Where the painting itself is concerned, the contract is remarkably prescriptive, listing not only the saints that should be included, which was fairly typical, but also their arrangement, which was not. And I'm just putting up on the screen here a short extract from a much, much longer contract um, where you'll see um, that the precise position of each saint is very clearly um, laid out. But I just wanted to draw your attention to the um, opening lines, um, which which um, insists that Bonozzo's um, Altarpiece should depict in, in the middle of the said table, the figure of Our Lady with a, uh, on a seat in modo et forma, in the um, manner and the, and the form and with the ornaments and with, and in, in similarity to the um, altarpiece on the high altar of San Marco of Florence. Um, the um, contract then goes on with the requirement that Bonotto should um, apply himself so that the finished painting will be better than any good painting that he's ever done to date and adds that at the very least that it should compare well to all his finest works. Um, it then stipulates that the scenes in the predella should depict episodes from the lives of the saints who appear in the main panel on the frame in the position where one might expect to see a coat of arms of a patron. Bonozzo was to paint two boys dressed in white with olive wreaths on their heads, holding shields, displaying the letters um, PSM, Purif Purificatio Santa Maria. The final part of the contract de details payments and deadlines. The confraternity will pay Bonotto 300 lira, which was to cover the costs of materials as well as labor. Uh, the group would pay him 100 lira up front, 80 lira after six months, and the remainder on completion, which was to be uh, just over a year from the date of the contract. The evocation of a specific work of art is rare in Quattrocento contracts, and the occurrence in this instance is very telling. Bonozzo's prescribed prototype, the high altarpiece of the Church of San Marco, had been painted by Frangelico about two decades earlier, when Bonozzo himself was a member of his workshop. This magnificent altarpiece was the single most prominent work of art at San Marco, and was also the image wherein the Quattrocento Medician altarpiece Prince, the, the, the principles of Quattrocento Medician altarpiece design had been codified, if you will. As Michelle O'Malley, among others, has pointed out, the choice of um, adverbial phrases like modo et forma was intended to invite a loose re visual relationship between the reference work and the commissioned run one rather than a direct imitation. But in making this visual relationship a contractual obligation, the Purification Brothers made plain their desire that the new altarpiece should entrench and proclaim their overlapping civic and ecclesiastical ties. And certainly there are several ways in which Bonotto did follow his elder master's example. He positioned the figures in front of a garden wall hung with a luxuriously woven cloth. He painted a line of trees running behind it, albeit more sparsely planted and with only the tops poking out in contrast to the fuller treatment in the San Marco panel. 
Benozzo's arrangement of the saints is loosely related to Angelico's, as are some of their gestures. The attitude of St. Dominic, for example, with his hands clasped, clasped in prayer and the lily draped over his shoulder, replicates that of Fra Angelico's St. Dominic, but turned on a 90 degree angle. There are significant ways, though, in which uh, Bonotto's image deviates. Diane Cole Al has observed how the serene interaction of Angelico's gathered company is replaced in Bonotto by an inner colloquy, and with, with each holy protagonist wrapped in individual contemplation. Bonotto also did away with the theatrical trappings of the curtains and the garlands. Um, as well as the majestically rendered carpet, which he probably considered surplus to requirements given his abandonment of Frangelico's rigorously applied system of one point linear perspective. In his drastic reduction of the depth of field, Bonotto reveals his absorption of the design strategies and settings found in a series of other altarpieces, also of Medician pedigree. Um, which had been painted in Florence in the intervening years. The first example is Angelico's so-called Palla d'Annalena, which, like Bonotto's panel, shows four of the six saints standing on a raised marble dais, with the final two in the grass, though standing, not kneeling. Except for the wall, Bonotto removed all architectural elements, and for this, um, Alessio Beldovi's um, Caffagiolo altarpiece seems to have been a point of reference. Fra Filippo Lippi's altarpiece for the novitiate chapel at Santa Croce was yet another Medician altarpiece towards which Bonozzo may have looked, especially for the figures of the Virgin and Child. Unlike the San Marco altarpiece, which was for the high altar of a large church, these examples were conceived for smaller spaces, chapels or oratories, and Bonozzo must have chosen the shallow depth of field with these more intimate settings of the oratory, with the more intimate setting of the oratory in mind. In contrast to the Medici altarpieces already cited, since Cosmas and Damien are absent from a Bonozzo's company of saints, presumably the main reason for this is that they are already featured in the altarpiece adorning the altar, or they were already featured in the altarpiece adorning the altar in the neighbouring chapel. But importantly too, despite Cosimo's continued beneficence towards the community, this was not a Medici commission. The altarpiece was paid for by a special levy on the confraternity's members. To some extent, Bonozzo's reliance on the example of earlier altarpieces is indicative simply of his wider absorption of the developments of Florentine art, which had taken place during his absence in the 1450s. But also by adhering to the established visual language of uh, prominent Medici altarpieces around the city, Bonozzo and his patrons could subtly convey the community's association and allegiance to the city's ruling family. As such, they could ensure the approval of their benefactor um, while, also, while also without compromising, sorry, the altarpiece's primary function as a visual declaration of the purification's strong collective identity and mission. As so eloquently expounded by Diane Cole Al in her extensive scholarship on the purification altarpiece, the image offered a painted counterpart to the statutes by which the confratelli lived and worshipped and encoded the group's spiritual and political allegiances as well as its focused as well as focused its ritual behaviors the web of social ties within which the confraternity operated and thrived was a driving force behind the choice of saints St. Peter, who holds the book and keys in one hand, leaving his left hand free for a gesture of blessing, represents the church and is a reminder that the company was sanctioned by the papacy. The community had taken possession of the oratory at San Marco on the feast day of St. Paul and Peter, and it was also on this day that members who had come of age formally left the group. Additionally, standing alongside St. Dominic, Peter's presence serves to align the confraternity with the Dominican community's central role as defenders of papal power. Dominic provides further institutional clout 
and physically situates the oratory, oratory and its resident brotherhood at San Marco. Similarly, the facing saints, St. Zenobius and St. John the Baptist serve to, late the serve to locate the community at the very heart of Florence's civic and spiritual life. In addition to being a model of penance and learning, St. Jerome further bolsters the sense of corporate identity, given the ongoing guardianship of the adult confraternity dedicated to St. Jerome. But not so deviated from his own earlier depictions of Jerome in Montefalco and Perugia, alluding to the office of cardinal with the discarded Gallero, but depicting Jerome in simple penitential garb, with a loose neckline to expose his flesh for self-mortification. The inclusion of St. Francis is less straightforward, um, but his pairing with Jerome, two great models of penitential spirituality, was common. He was also a foil for St. Dominic, the founder of the other great mendicant order. It is worth remembering that the four adult members of the company who witnessed Bonazzo's contract were called Domenico, Giovanni, Piero and Francesco. However, I'm loath to read too much into this since the language of the contract really stresses these men's roles, not as individuals, but as elective representatives acting in nome di tutto il corpo, in the name of all the company. And given the corporate nature of the commission, as underscored in the contract, it seems doubtful that any of the saints were included to commemorate the involvement of a specific individual. The sense of close-knit institutional identity is built into the image's design, even more so than in the earlier Florentine altarpieces already cited. Bonozzo has pushed the saintly protagonist right up against the picture plane so that the figures are monumental in relation to their surroundings. Even allowing for the panel having been slightly reduced um, along the bottom edge, Bonozzo's seated virgin takes up two thirds the height of the painted surface, while the kneeling saints occupy over a half. The effect is a huddled closeness which projects a visual statement of corporate strength. It also lends prominence to the overall richness of the pictorial surface. Juxtaposed and overlapping, the cornucopia of fabrics and material is characterized by saturated color and tooled gilding. The careful depiction of silk, linen, gauze, wool, woven patterns and embroidery would have had special resonance for a community of boys, many of whom were starting out in the cloth trade. But not so too, we must remember, was the son of a tailor and had recently married the daughter of a mercer, that is a, a trader of luxury materials. The painting's surface presents a rich tapestry whose overall de decorative effect recalls one scholar's description of the Medici Chapel frescoes as a panoply of gold shot coloristic exuberance. Nowhere is this effect more impressive than in the depiction of angels who encircle the Virgin with their multicolored peacock wings, glazed and gilded with intricate precision. The splendor of the altarpiece would have been matched by the lavish costumes donned by the community for the sacred plays that they performed in the oratory space. In fact, one of the very first purchases that the group made in relation to these performances was a batch of multicolored silks to be used to make the angels costumes. Among scholars, the main panel of the purification altarpiece has generally received lackluster appraisal. Nick Penny, acknowledging the beauty of the central virgin and surrounding angels, judged their relationship to the accompanying saints unsatisfactory and, he assumed, the product of significant workshop participation. Among the altarpieces perceived failings, Anna Pado Rizzo noted the panel's Freddo Academismo. But the qualities of Bonozzo's panel now deemed disappointing its mechanical clarity and the simplicity of arrangement would surely have appealed to his patrons. The heavily didactic, didactic aspects of the painting are typical features of Bonozzo's art, no doubt a contributing factor to the confraternity's selection of him for the task. Indeed, Bonozzo seems to have amplified these tendencies, 
apparently in direct response to his brief to supply an image whose principal audience would consist of children and for a context that was fundamentally pedagogical. The image is littered with symbols of Mary's purity, particularly the lily, which is methodically repeated in the hands of the angels of St. Dominic growing in the foreground and even in the, uh, held by the angel of the Annunciation on Zenobius's cloak. Similarly, the milky white pearls on the Virgin's morse are echoed in Zenobius's bejeweled mitre. Other symbols of the Virgin's purity include the ermine lining of her mantle, which were not so carefully exposed at the neck, sleeve, knee and hem, and the Stella Maris, which according to St. Bernard of Clairvaux's homily to the Virgin, also carried these associations. As observed by Anne Machetti, the, um, the task of directing the attention of a large group of adolescent boys would have been a challenge. And during the company's orations, their adult guardians used handheld signs inscribed with instructions with uh, words such as silence and first chorus. By the same token, Bonazzo harnessed texts as well as symbol to purvey the confraternity's institutional ideas. He included his hallmark identifying halos, um, identifying inscription in the saints' halos. The virgin's halo is inscribed with the angel Gabriel's Ave Maria salutation to Mary, while her hemline bears the opening words of the Ave Regina Caelorum, the Marian antiphone assigned for use during the period from the Feast of the Purification to the beginning of Holy Week. These inscriptions are multi-purpose insofar as they signal the Marian dedication of the oratory and the eternity itself, while also alluding to the singing of Laude, which would have taken place before the image. Both the neckline and of, of Peter's robe and his book also bear inscriptions. Along his collar are inscribed Christ's words, um, you are Peter and on this um, rock is, is uh, implied. And on his book are the Peter's words to Christ, you are Christ, son of the living God. Both inscriptions are reminders of Peter's primacy among the apostles and in turn an acknowledged substantiation of papal legitimacy. The import of these inscriptions is reinforced by the depiction on St. Zenobius's cope of Christ summoning Peter to leave the boat to walk on water. The five remaining scenes on Zenobius's cloak, each meticulously painted to ensure legibility, show episodes related to childhood. Four are scenes from the early life and adolescence of the Virgin, the Annunciation to Joachim, the birth of the Virgin, the presentation of the Virgin at the temple, the marriage of the Virgin and the Annunciation. The final scene um, shows the nativity and the only known episode from Jesus's childhood, Christ in the temple, a scene whose theme is inherently related to religious instruction. The predella panels are exquisite. Um, they are lively and engagingly rendered narratives. Um, as on Zenobius's cope, a number of the episodes are concerned with children and are also populated with youthful onlookers. The miracle of Saint Zenobius, for example, where a child is brought back from the dead, shows several young men gathered in the crowd, two wearing robes with a processional banner. They are attendants of the miracle working Zenobius, but also recalling the boys of the confraternity in their processional garb. A similar acolyte in white robes accompanies the priest in the central scene of the purification of the Virgin. In contrast, the adolescents who enjoy Salome's dance in the Baptist panel offer a cautionary warning against the temptations of the flesh, appropriate for a company whose statutes place firm emphasis on the importance of its members' chastity. Though scholars have often observed that the Bradella is of super, superior painterly quality to the main panel, it was evidently conceived with the overall visual coherence of the altarpiece in mind. Gen reflecting before the altar, the Bradella would have been the first element that the boy's eyes fell upon. Accordingly, Bonazzo adjusted the perspective for a low viewpoint. Just as in the main panel and even the images on Zenobius's cope, the predella scenes are all lit from the left. 
and I particularly love the um, Feast of Herod that is on the screen now with the, the, the light kind of streaming onto the back of Salome's dress and creating this kind of shot silk effect. Um, but not so planned, the whole so ensemble with the, its, with the altarpiece placement in the oratory in mind, where light streamed in from the north windows overlooking the garden, the site of modern day Via de la Dogana. In addition to this consistent light source, several linkages run through the padella, both thematic and compositional. For example, the Peter and Baptist scenes share the same, em the same emptiness in the central space, which is occupied only by the um, two sinful protagonists, Salome and Simon Magus. The scenes depicting miracles performed by St. Zenobius and St. Dominic, both involving the resuscitation of a child, are mutually reinforcing in their placement at either end of the predella. As well as running horizontally through the predella, the visual, the visual connections also run vertically from predella to palla. The echoed poses of St. Zenobius and Dominic in the main panel complement the mirroring of their to predella scenes below. We observe too how the standing pose of the naked child is recalled in the stance of the child in the purification directly below. His mother standing, oh sorry, these are, his mother standing nearby um, wears the same red dress and blue ermine lined mantle as she does in the main panel. The scene of the miracle of St. Zenobius relies closely um, relies closely on Gobetti's bronze frontal for the shrine of the bishop saint inside the cathedral and this reliance on of Bonotto on Ghiberti and pictorial solutions has often been pointed out. In particular the painter chose to retain what Miklos Boscovitz called the archaic solution of depicting the child twice in a single episode before and after his revival. This is a narrative strategy that he employed in other scenes in the predella too, for Salome in the Feast of Herod, Simon Magus in the St. Peter episode, and the resuscitated child in the Miracle of St. Dominic. Typically taken as ev uh, evidence of Bonozzo's traditionalizing tendencies, surely these solutions were also adopted with the altarpiece's pedagogical function at the forefront of his mind. And so to conclude, the oratory in which Bonozzo's altarpiece was erected was the beating heart of the confraternity. It was not only the main locus of the Campagna's internal activities, but also their public facing ones, as the space where their plays were performed and the major civic feast days were celebrated. Both for its didactic clarity and for its effective visualization of the company's corporate strength, Bonozzo's altarpiece must have proven highly pleasing to his patrons. Visually arresting, splendid with color and gold, the work established a, a visual context before which many facets of confraternal life played out. The confraternity's satisfaction that Bonozzo had fulfilled his brief is evidenced by the fact that they retained the altarpiece despite several relocations until their community was suppressed in the 18th century. As for Bonozzo, it seems that he too was contented and his altarpiece for the purification would become the blueprint for almost every other altarpiece that he painted throughout the rest of his long career. Thank you very much. Okay. Um... Uh, Laura, can I ask you to unshare your screen so that the thumbnails can pop up? There we are. I'll put, just get some light on the room so people can see what's going on. There we are. Well, not that one. Oh, yeah, better. Okay. Um, so as, as is normal, we will now go to questions and comments from anyone in the room. If you just put your hand up, I'll bring a microphone to you. Um, or if you're on the Zoom and want to uh, make a comment, or ask a question, please, you can, there's two ways to go. You can either put something in the chat um, or you can simply unmute yourself, uh, show us your face and say something. So um, 
whilst people are thinking of what they want to say, I, I want to just ask a question, Laura, two questions actually, one very small. Um, you referred to Gotsali as Bonozzo a lot, and earlier on you were saying that he was only named Gotsali by Vasari. So could you unscramble his name for us? And the second one was the, um, the journey of the altarpiece from the confraternity to eventually finding its place in the National Gallery in London. Yeah. Um, yes, the, um, um, the question of the, of the name, um, Basically, what happens is um, Bonotto, all through his life, um, refers to himself in all documents and in signatures and everything else that we have as um, Bonotto, Bonotto di Lese, son of Lese. And um, but Vasari, and I sort of alluded to this, but didn't go into it because it's a bit complicated, and, and I don't really know enough. But he basically, in between the two editions of his lives, um, the sort of eighteen-year gap that he has between the two, he goes kind of mad for genealogy, and he goes himself finding a lot of um, artists' genealogies from the previous century, and he finds a group of um, Gotzelis living in a kind of nearby village to where Bonozzo grew up, and he establishes that. Um, that the family name was Gotsali, even if Bonozzo's own family didn't sort of use it. So he applies it to him. Um, so it's not as mad as some of Vasari's names, um, but I, I don't know, it's kind of my natural tendency is to refer to Bonozzo with the name that he used for himself, um, because he, I think he would have been quite surprised if you'd shouted Gotsali down the street. I think he would have like, not turned around. <laughs> Um, but but there is you know there is there is there, there is evidence now that he probably was from this 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 family. Um, the story of the altarpiece arrival is at the at the National Gallery is kind of a, a fairly typical um, mid nineteenth century um, you know that moment before um, the Italians um, kind of shut the borders to the export of pictures when um, uh, Charles Eastlake and his um, um, company were. Um, filling the National Gallery with, you know, um, the best examples of um, Quattrocento Florentine painting that they could find. Um, the altarpiece arrived in the collection um, in the mid 19th century as part of that endeavor. Okay, thank you very much. So in the room, has anyone got something they want to say? Question they'd like to ask, comment? Um, on the, the Zoom, have we got anyone wanting to participate? Um, Okay, we, we've got two in the chat. Lawrence Bass, a practical question. How long will the Gotsali exhibition be on view? I can't answer that, I'm afraid. No. I, um, <laughs> I, I, I should know because we're lending, a, we are lending to it. We're lending a small panel, which I did put on the screen at the beginning of um, the um, talk um, because unfortunately the large panel couldn't travel, but you know, it's a project that we really wanted to support. Um, but I imagine sort of into the spring, perhaps March, April, but um, the exhibition um, will open next week. And at that point, I'm sure it will have a dedicated page on the website where all information um, will, can be found. Um, and uh, a question from Virginia Phillips and also in the chat, why does Bonozzo put the saints names on their halos? Oh, thank you very much to, um, Alan Brabo. Yeah, 10th of March is when the next week. 10th of March. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, um, I don't know. I mean, I think that um, it, it's, it's a kind of signature thing that um, he doesn't always do it. So I wonder about, um, I actually have a slide. I'm going to quickly share my screen again because I made a slide, which then I didn't sort of make it into the, um, PowerPoint um, because I didn't need it, but it really sort of it, just for those of you who aren't as familiar with Bonozzo, um, he, he it's it's one of the things that slightly damages his reputation because he does this he does this really sort of um, almost quite basic thing of put, even putting Angelus on the uh, angels' halos and you kind of think like you know really <laughs> um, but um, he doesn't always do it he chooses to do it in certain contexts and it, it does seem to become a sort of um, a form of form of signature in a way 
um, something that really um, separates him out. And I hope uh, that I argued um, in this paper, it's also part of his brand to be to be the kind of mechanically clear um, or an almost didactic painter. Um, he's doing that on purpose, and it's maybe something that hasn't done wonders for his reputation later, but it, that there's no evidence that it wasn't exactly what his patrons were asking of him and it, a, a brief that he was fulfilling very kind of adeptly. Okay. Thank you. Um, and um, another question coming in from Mar Maria Rosa. Do we have information of the helping hands, laborers and so on in the painting of the Magi Chapel? Do we know what, what, who the team doing that work? Mm, um, yeah. No. The short answer is no. It's uh, an, uh, the names. I mean, we have we're, no question that he was being helped. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if he was being helped by um, the types of people who'd also been on the scaffold with Fra Angelico just 10 years earlier. People like um, Domenico de Michelino and Zenobi Strozzi and, and people in, in kind of relation to that kind of crowd, but in terms of individual names and who was there. Um, no, we did, the, the, the documents that we have relate to the commission and then also um, a, really, a series of really fascinating letters that are exchanged between um, Piero di Medici and Benozzo during the course of the, um, the execution of the, of the frescoes because um, the, the sort of fresco season is the summer. So that's when the Medici would have you know, got out of Florence at all costs to escape the heat and the pestilence and Benozzo was working in the chapel during those months and corresponding with um, Piero and we have this amazing, um, you know, one of the earliest and most complete set of, of kind of artist to patron correspondences of this period. Yeah, I, I mean, typically in the Quattrocento, the, 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 the masters would, would have their workshops and if they had a major fresco cycle, there would be really a lot of people up and down scaffolding doing it. Is that correct? Yes, absolutely. Um, and a lot, a lot, you know, a lot of the work was particularly where frescoes are concerned, it's, it's, it's kind of manual labor because you have to, um, there's a kind of speed with which things need to be done because of the, um, the, the very nature of the materials that you're using. They would dry out very quickly. So you can't kind of prepare all your plaster at the beginning of the day um, because it will be dry by the time you want to put it on the walls. So you need a kind of constant um, chain of, of labor that um, can ensure a kind of very efficient process. And, and you know, this is the kind of capacity that Bonotto himself is acting in early on in his career. So it's not that he's training in, in the traditional sense of the word often, but he's coming in as a skilled help. Um, and and I, I alluded to, but didn't go into the kind of trouble that we have with Bonotto's own apprenticeship, is that, that there isn't really any evidence that um, Fra Angelico took on um, apprentices in the traditional sense of the word. It seems more likely that when his um, fresco campaigns got to the point where he needed extra hands he would call people in but that he you know because he's a full-time Dominican friar he doesn't have the time or the kind of wherewithal to run a um, traditional workshop in the sense of um, training up apprentices. Mm -hmm. okay. So yes we've got, we got one in the room I'll bring you the microphone. Was um, Benozzo more known for his frescoes or his panel paintings and other works? Um, I think actually more for his frescoes, probably ultimately. That's where his, um, that's where his kind of name rings through eternity. Um, and I mentioned briefly that a lot of them are lost, but you know, Vasari saw his frescoes in Rome, his frescoes in Viterbo are completely lost, but we have them, a record of them from drawings made much later um, in, the, in the 19th century, I believe. Um, and uh, of course his frescoes in Pisa, which are very damaged. Um, but I think this might be the reason that, Bot that Bonozzo is kind of always on the move because he has this reputation for being a very, very expert uh, painter of fresco. Another one. You mentioned that um, I think art historians were quite critical of his altarpiece, um, but yet the, the contract between the, you know, the patrons and the artist w went into enormous detail about what he was allowed to paint. And so I'm wondering, is it fair to criticize the artist or is it the patrons that bear responsibility for that? And also, 
is that being reappraised? Has, has, has opinion shifted uh, in his favor subsequently? Um, I think it's really it's, it's a really interesting question about you know that this is a particularly prescriptive contract, and, but at the same time, it, it all it says is where people should go it doesn't necessarily say you know he needs to have his hand raised he needs to have his head on this angle you know it's not so in depth that there's no opportunity for Bonazzo to kind of um be creative in terms of the, his, the, the stances and poses and expressions of his various saints um I I I think that both I think that it, the 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 commission and, and the, this altarpiece would have been very much in, in the minds of the patrons and the artists would have been a kind of joint endeavor that the two parties were kind of creating together um so i think that in a way um the uh, what i'm trying to do here i suppose is to appraise the altarpiece from the point of view of what i think the patron wanted and from for, for that i think but not so gets full marks um and so in a way i'm trying to it's a you know it's a bit like the perennial debate that we have in the 20th and now 21st century about workshop you know is this the hand of the master is this the hand of the pupil but it's um it's an evaluation of the works in question from in a, in a way that is completely sort of anachronistic and doesn't um, do justice to the to the the way in which these works of art were made because that just simply wouldn't have been a concern. And I think similarly, um, fine, we we can look at it now and maybe not see all the kind of creativity and all the um, genius that um, some of Bonazzo's contemporaries were. were um, capable of but in terms of you know getting the job done fulfilling his brief satisfying his patrons um i think that that you know there's 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 nothing lacking um so yeah sorry I, I, was there a second part to the question that i haven't answered it's difficult when it's a disembodied voice <laughs> uh, the, the, the the disembodied voice is is nodding vigorously and seems happy so okay <laughs> it has a fully attached body in the room i'm delighted to say <laughs> okay um before we go uh, for any last thoughts i just want to put in my regular plea to the zoomers who are still allowed to register so free of charge and uh, if you've enjoyed the talk if you would consider making a donation however large or small you feel comfortable with we need just a little bit more to get to our target for the uh, for the autumn season which would make me and my board very happy um, so anything you could do is much appreciated. Um, I'm just going to get my glasses on because there's lots going on in the chat. There's a, there's a question here. Um, yeah, okay, you did, did Bonazzo have an immediate or significant influence on other 15th century painters or was there a different succession to how art then developed? Well, um, big question. Um, definitely not going to answer it that well, but um, I think that his departure in around 1465 is really significant because I, you know, I tried to paint a little bit of a picture of the kind of Florentine art scene um, it, during those years, and, and and it's really the kind of changing of the guard in many respects because what happens when Bonazzo leaves and then basically doesn't come back is you have the kind of um, the rising stars of the next generation. So it's initially the Polaiolo, Verrocchio, Ghilandaio, and then you know quite hot on the heels of them, um, Botticelli, Filippino Lippi, and so. Um, I think that what you have in these uh, this kind of second wave of the early Renaissance um, painterly tradition in Florence is a, a very, very profound and new interest in the human body, um, particular ramping up of um, drawing and studies from life. So I think that in, in a way, um, the real emphasis on surface and the really, really skilled approach to um, decoration, ornament, texture, um, uh, very, very, very exquisite and, and skillful use of gold um, does die a sort of death at this moment where you have a, a kind of new, new generation of painters who really dominate the art scene in Florence in, um, the, in, in, in the second half of the 15th century. Um, and then do we know from the contract and correspondence which parts Monazzo did do in the chapel? No, <laughs> sadly not, because they didn't care. This is the thing. I mean, if Monazzo had written in a letter, you know, I did this angel, but my associate did this one, they, they wouldn't, they, it wouldn't. <laughs> what they want is the best and you know they 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 trusting Bonazzo's judgment to bring in a, a painter of landscape or a painter of animals for this particular bit or um or, or, you know whatever it might be there is a really lovely exchange where Piero um says that he doesn't think the angels um on the altar wall are up to much 
and Benotso so writes back and says that he can turn them into clouds if needs be <laughs> and um somehow it gets resolved because the angels are still there so you can go and have a look at them and see if you think they're up to scratch okay um I have to shout this one. Alice Smith Duncan comments that Laura has the face of a, of a Renaissance angel. So. <laughs> <laughs> Overheating in the National Gallery's basement meeting room. So. <laughs> um, the, the question about was he a contemporary of Gentile da Fabriano? No, but um, I think that you're absolutely right to think about the adoration of the Magi and the Uffizi. I mean, the, I, I cannot overstate the impact that Gentile has in the brief years that he is in Florence in the um, 1420s. So, you know, Bonotto is a baby, a babe in arms when he's there, but it, you know, really ricochets down through the generations. And in the um, Palazzo Medici, the in the in the in the chapel frescoes, there's no question that the kind of pomp and splendor and, and all the wonders of Gentile Fabriano is of, of the Strozzi adoration are kind of at the forefront of his mind. It's, it's interesting because I, I, I think this, this exhibition is very timely because a lot of people know about the, the, the chapel of the, of, the, of the Magi at the Palazzo because it, it is a, a wonderful work and in some ways it's the almost quintessential Renaissance fresco cycle. But apart from that, um, Bonozzo's reputation doesn't uh, burn bright in the same way as perhaps Ghirlandaio or Fra Angelic or Filippino Lippi. Um, and, and the rest of them. And I, I wonder whether you think, Laura, that he um, is due a, a, an elevation into the pantheon of, of the first rank of the Quattrocento painters. I think that the issue you have with painters like Bonozzo, and there's many of them, is the accident of survival. Um, and so often an artist's reputation has been entirely defined by what is left or how what kind of condition the works of art that have survived are in. Um, I think Bonotto is good at, is very, very good at a lot of things. I don't necessarily think that he, um, that he has the, um, the kind of verve and um, the ability to kind of push boundaries, perhaps, of someone like um, Filippo Lippi or Paolo Uccello, to think of people in his own generation. Um, but I think that he's a he's a he's a product of Florence in the middle of the 15th century in terms of you know really standing on the shoulders of giants in terms of his technical prowess, his unbelievable capacity when it comes to the kind of handling of his materials, a really solid understanding of the fresco technique and also um, many, many different forms of um, gilded decoration. Um, and I mean, yes, I think that I think that you should go on the Bonozzo pilgrimage go to Montefalco if you haven't. Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful experience. And I think that you can really get lost in um, Bonozzo as fresco painter. Um, I also think that his small scale panels are um, where you find perhaps some of the, the points of greatest originality and kind of um, narrative prowess and kind of complexity. I, I, I mean, I love our panel. Um, it's a, I, I love having it in the galleries and and um, but I do think that um, Predella is where you really find Bonozzo's uh, creative juices flowing and this kind of power of imagination in evidence. Very good. I think that's probably quite a good note to end on unless somebody else has got something they wanted to add or another question I want to raise because I think we should all be going off to Montefalco <laughs> to see more of our Gotzeli. But, or Bonozzo, as I must learn to call him. Um, and you, can call, you can call him Gottsley, that's fine. <laughs> I've been Gottsley all my life, so it's a revelation I've got it from. Um, no, um, I don't think you have. I think plenty of people call him Gottsley. It is a surname. It's not like calling Leonardo da Vinci da Vinci, which obviously is a uh, big no-no. <laughs> um, those in the room, if you want to go to the exhibition on, on, the, on the special guided tour next uh, Friday the 17th, um, leave a name with Sarah too, because I think we will be able to subscribe on that. So it just remains for me to thank Laura very much indeed for giving us your time and for zooming in from London. I'm sorry that the, the timing meant that you weren't here in person, but um, 
No, me too. I'll be back sometime when, when time's a bit more normal and you can come and tell us something more about Renaissance painting because it was a joy having you with us. Um, and uh, those in the room, we will now retire for the traditional glass of wine, which I'm afraid we can't share with the Zoomers. But Zoomers, it was lovely seeing you. And um, if we don't see you, uh, well, see some of you maybe for the co Christmas concert, but otherwise let's uh, reunite uh, in January when we get going again. Um, so good night, everybody. And thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Thank you.